You know, home is where the heart is. And your heart's not in a place, not in a house. It's with the people you love. And that song gets truer the older you get. You get homesick for home, because home ain't this world no more. The older you get, the more people in heaven. And that's where your home is, amen, your eternal home. We started this morning talking about judgment of the tempter. Well, tonight we're gonna do the last two, the judgment of the temptress and the judgment of the traitor. Let's go to Genesis chapter number three and verse number 16. Genesis chapter three and verse number 16. Notice it's the opposite of John 3, 16, okay? John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Now listen to John, uh, Genesis 3, 16. It's the proto-evangel of the Bible. It's the first mention of the gospel. He says, unto the woman, he said, and ladies, before I say, read this verse, I want to make something clear to you. This verse really raises women to a higher level than men. Really does. You listen to it. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. God put the full blame on Adam because he willingly partook of the fruit. The woman was tricked. She was tempted and she fell into sin. The twist here is that the woman's pain, listen to this carefully, would be man's gain. Because somewhere down the line a savior would be born. Say amen. And God would use woman to bring that savior into the world. Her punishment would be painful, but the end result would be joyous. I'll never forget when both of our boys were born, three years apart, in the hospital, same pain, but as soon as them babies was born and the doctor gave that baby to my wife, she didn't holler no more. She didn't make them grimacing faces no more. She didn't squeeze my hand off no more. It's all about that little baby. She forgot all about the pain she just went through because she had something to gain for all that pain. Well, God was telling Eve, this is a, this is a terrible thing I have to do to punish you for your sin. But your pain will one day be your gain. Aren't we glad that we gained Jesus, amen? Part two of her judgment would be her submission to her husband. Since Eve had failed to handle things well on her own, she'd be in subjection to her husband. This was God's declaration, take it up with him, don't get mad with me. This is what God said, not what Walter said. And so therefore, because of that fact, uh, she would be under subjection to her husband for the rest of her days. Now, let's look at the judgment of the traitor in verses 17 through 21. It says in verse 17, And unto Adam he said, Behold, thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee saying, thou shalt not eat thereof. She was the wrong advisor. Not that she was bad, not that she was a bad person, but she was the wrong person to take advice from. He, she, he was to take his advice from his Lord and his Savior, not from his wife. And he looked to the wrong person for advice. How many times do we as Christians look to the wrong people for advice? When trouble comes, instead of hitting our knees, we hit the telephone. First person you ought to talk to when a problem comes is God, not another man. It breaks God's heart when we listen to the voice of others and not to him. He takes our relationship seriously when we do not take it seriously. It hurts him. 
There are dire consequences for not listening to God. The true test of discipleship is listening. Listening, that's the true test. Are you listening to God? Are you really his disciple? Jesus said, my sheep know me, and they what? They hear me, and they follow me. Therefore, are you a true disciple? Are you listening? Are you following? John 10, 27 says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Revelation 3, 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and sup with him and he with me. If you listen to the door, if you listen to the door, you'll let him in. When the Holy Spirit knocks at your heart, listen to him. Listen to him. Pay attention to him. Don't take the wrong advice. And number two, he says, you're going to have weeds in agriculture. Look at verse 17b. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat it of, of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Now that's the part that hurts me right now because I'm sick of lettuce. Say amen or oh me. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat what? I ain't even had no bread. Nothing but that old sorry low down stinking lettuce. Then they bring me a bowl today of some kind of endive. And all kind of purple looking lettuce. But I ate it. It was that or nothing. Say amen or oh me. So I ate it. Here we see a loss of complete divine provision. That's the punishment. They had been provided. The Lord had provided everything for them. They had it made. They had it made. Everything they needed. Everything they wanted. Everything they could ever have was there in the garden. God provided. But now it wasn't going to be that way anymore. Thorns and thistles. Man, alive, I used to hate it when I'd get in the garden. And I'd start pulling them green beans. And all of a sudden, I'd re reach in a green bean bush and hit a thorn bush. Stick my hands, make me say ugly words. Don't y'all look so innocent? Huh? Hey, I learned real quickly. There were some thorns and briars in the patch. What really scared me one day was I reached and there was a snake laying down there. Say amen or oh man. I said, I don't need them beans that bad. Say amen, oh man. When I got my cousin, he went and got the snake out and killed and got rid of him. But folks, now man would have to work for his own food and his own livelihood. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not what? Neither should ye eat. Boy, I like to work. Dead crowd. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command that by, and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness, in other words, hush your mouth, they work. There's some to that saying, shut your mouth and go to work. God said it. Be quiet. Quit being a busybody, gossiping all the time. Accomplish something you can do something about that you can make a profit for the kingdom. Oh, listen to me. Not only was man now to work, but the ground he had to work with was cursed. I mean, it was bad enough he had to work, but then God cursed the earth on top of it. I'll tell you, it's hard living in this world. It's hard making a life in this world. It's not easy. But it has to be that way because it was a judgment on Adam. Thorns, thistles, and barrenness. Man was physically now on his own. Aren't you glad Jesus died and the Holy Spirit lives within us and we're not on our own anymore? He's with us every day, every mile of the way. We'll just yield to him. He's right there with us. Now, wrong advisor, weeds and agriculture, wast an art. Look at verse 19. Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast taken for dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. Now we see the promises of physical death. Most horrible thing we have to deal with is death. I don't mind weddings. You get to eat a piece of cake, say amen. But I hate funerals. It's heartbreaking. It's all I can do to stand up here and see people crying and me not want to join in with them and cry with them. It's hard. It breaks my heart to see someone have to suffer losing a loved one. But God has given us physical death as a human picture of what spiritual death will be. 
He gave us death as a picture, an example to know what it's like to be away from God. I'll never forget the, the night I went to the funeral home. See my grandmother in South Boston. I went early because I didn't want everybody to see me fall apart because I knew I was. Because I could see her standing at that door when I pull up on the carport, smiling. And she opened that door. Ooh, you could smell she'd been cooking. We'd go in, she'd feed me. Let me what I watch what I want to on TV. And if a man who's lived in the household with a mom and daddy and four brothers and sisters get to watch what you want to on TV is a privilege. Amen. Now kids got TV in every room, one on their telephone. Amen. But back then, boy, it was a privilege to get to watch what you want to on TV. She said, watch whatever you want to. And I did. She pulled my bed back for me. Got me ready for bed. I knew she was gone. And she won't come in back. It hurt. Broke my heart. So I stand there looking in that casket. She couldn't talk back to me. I want to tell you something. God spoke to me and he said, that's what it's like. When you're not faithful to me, you won't hear from me. Spiritual death. If there's one reason for us to stay away from sin, it's to keep that airway open between us and God. Amen? So he can hear us and we can hear him. But that was our example. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a fact that if the body lays around long enough, it turns back into dust. Job 10, 9. Remember, I beseech thee that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me to dust again. Job 34, 15. All flesh perisheth together, and man shall turn to dust unto dust. Psalms 103, verse 14. For he knoweth our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. But for man, his days are as the grass, the flower of the field, so he flourisheth, and for the wind passeth over it, and it's gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto his children's children. I'm glad I'm never gonna be separated from God, aren't you? I'll never know what it is to know spiritual death after I die. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to the God who gave it. You see, God breathed in the man the breath of life. Our soul belongs to God. We're literally the children of God. And if you choose Christ, your breath and soul goes to heaven. If you refuse, you die and go to hell. There's a little boy was in Sunday school and uh, he was real quiet when he went home that day in the back seat of the car and the father said son are you okay he said I'm just a little worried about what my Sunday school teacher taught this morning well son what did he teach taught about death so the daddy left it alone he thought it was probably the first time a little boy had ever thought about death and so he watched him real carefully and he got out of the car and he ran upstairs and he went and looked under the bed and he kept looking. He went from one side to the other. And Daddy said, son, what are you looking for? He said, Daddy, my Sunday school teacher said that when somebody died, their body went back to dust. And Daddy, there's somebody under my bed. I don't know if they're coming or going, but there's somebody under my bed. <laughs> I'm glad we don't have to worry about that, aren't you? He can put dust back together again, can't he? Humpty Dumpty and all the king's men couldn't put all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. But I tell you what, God can put us back together. Amen. Thank God for that. Then verse twenty. And Adam called his wife named Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Here we see one of the most gentlemanly acts in the Bible. Adam bestowed honor upon Eve, and that's the way it should be, folks. Ken, I'm going to skip to Genesis 3.21. That's one of the most honorable things a man can do is honor his wife. It's one of the greatest things a man can do is put her on a pedestal and treat her as fine china. 
God didn't put woman on earth for him to step on, for him to lord over. He took woman out of the rib of man because he took her out of the rib. It's the closest thing to man's heart. Amen? Therefore, a man ought to love his wife and treat her as fine china. Number five, willful atonement. Verse 30, 21. And Adam also to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Here we see in the Bible the sacrifice in the Bible having to deal with man's sin. God here gives Adam and Eve their first glimpse, eyeball, eyeball of physical death. Here Adam, give Eve, Adam and Eve are given their first glimpse of that lamb laying on that altar as he slayed that little lamb. And that little lamb bleated for its life, but the blood poured and the lamb died right before their eyes. They'd never seen that before. But God was making an impression on their mind what death really was. Death was a horrible thing. Being separated from God for all of eternity is what? A horrible thing. It's an awful thing. And I want to tell you here tonight, we better realize what blessed people we are to know the Lord and to know the Lord and to know his salvation Hey, there was, was in a way a punishment having to watch that gruesome death. This poor innocent animal had to die because of what they had done. They were the cause of that animal being having his throat slit. I don't know about you, but that had been hard for me to swallow. Little lamb dying because of what I did. Him paying for what I done. But that's what happened. This animal paid a heavy price for Adam and Eve's foolishness and Adam and Eve's selfishness. There's no doubt that this is a foreshadow of the coming of Jesus, what he did on the cross of Calvary. This animal paid the price. He paid the atonement. Atonement is defined as a covering. You see, all the lamb's blood did was cover man's sin until Jesus came. But when Jesus came, his blood removed our sin. Boy, aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad he paid your sin debt? Hey, listen, you ought to be hanging off her afters. We're not talking about a, a, a daily ball game. We're talking about your eternal existence was paid for by the blood of an innocent man. The bad things you did, he paid for. He took those nails because of the rotten things we did, the sins we took. The sad part is for 4,000 years, many innocent animals would die to cover man's sin until the Lamb of God came. The perpetual sacrifices were made for three reasons. Number one, man continued to commit new sins every day. Number two, there were new children born every day. Number three, animal blood was not strong enough to remove sin. It just covered it. And here's a very important fact that must be pointed out. All sin must be dealt with. Either you let Jesus deal with it on the cross or you can pay for it in hell for all eternity. I take the first choice. How about you? Hebrews 9, 11, but Christ being come uh, a high priest of good things to come by greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. This, uh, that is to say, not of this building, neither of the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood he entered into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Not temporary, but eternal. They had to come back every year and make sacrifices. Jesus was once and for all. Amen. All to him I owe, sin hath left its crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkled the unclean, sanctified to the peering of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, to purge your conscience, your mind from dead works to serve the living God. You see, he died for us to serve, not to sit soaking sour. But to get out of these pews and go out into a world and tell people there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine. There was blood sacrificed to pay for their sins. I sat outside of Walmart the other day and I counted. 32 bags come out with Budweiser and liquor and beer. So how you know? Because you can see through the bags. Say amen or oh me. I thought, man alive. They're, they're, they're trying to get out of their problems by drinking I'm out. The only way to get rid of your problems is to have them washed in the blood of the Lamb. Say amen or oh me. 
What did this verse just say? Your conscience. You want to know why people get drunk? Because their conscience is eating at them. They're trying to forget the bad things that have happened or bad things they have done. They're trying to forget what's really happening in reality. Hey, reality is get in Christ and he'll take care of everything. Amen? He'll take care of you. He'll take care of your past, your present, and your future. He'll take care of it all. We're to serve the living God. And this is the cause. He's the mediator of the New Testament. See, the Old Testament's gone, folks. The Old Testament was the blood of calves and goats. We're in the New Testament, the blood of Jesus. I'm glad I was born in this Testament. How about you? It says that by the means of death for redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they were also called might receive the promise of eternal life. For where a testament is, there must be a necessity of the death of the tester. For the testament is of the force after men are dead, otherwise of so much strength at all while the tester liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was de dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wood and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto me, unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with what? Blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. As we come to this table tonight, that little cracker is a picture of the body of Christ. That cup is a picture of the blood of Christ. We do this and we do this ritual four times a year to remind us of what it costs Jesus to save us, hoping it'll spark our conscience to serve the living God, to leave here and do great things for the Lord, to strive to live for him and not for self. Tonight I encourage you, first of all, as we have this invitation, ask God to forgive you of your sins. Second of all, if you're lost, not saved, get saved tonight. But deal with your sin problem. And then let's come to the Lord's table. And let's deal with our relationship with him. If there's something between us and God, let's get it taken care of tonight. Amen? Confess it, forsake it, and remove it. And let's leave here tonight soldiers of the cross. Soldiers of the cross. You see, folks, just like fishing, you don't catch the first time you throw something in the water. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes you don't catch anything. Sometimes you've got to go fishing three or four times before you catch something. Listen to your preacher. Don't give up on soul winning. Don't give up on your sisters. Don't give up on your brothers. Don't give up on your friends. Keep witnessing to them. The preacher, they get so mad at me. They're not mad at you. They're mad at themselves because they're not accepting. But one day they're gonna accept it. I went to one lady's house 50 times. And every time I'd say, sister, wouldn't you like to get saved today? Nope, that's what she tell me, nope. But on that 50th time, I said, sister, wouldn't you like to get saved? She said, I think I will. Well, after they give me mouth to mouth resuscitation and uh, CPR and all that stuff, I led her to the Lord. Couldn't believe she finally gave in to Jesus. Don't give up, live so that others might not die. That's what this is about. Communion is let's get close to God so we can get other people close to God. Let God use our lives to do greater things. I love you folks. I think we got the greatest and most greatest potential of people I know of anywhere. But you've got to realize your potential. You've got to realize your opportunity. I can't do it for you. You've got to take the bull by the horn. You got to make your mind up. You're going to give your time, your talent, your treasure to God. That you're going to sacrifice yourself and your will for His. And watch God do some great things for you. There's no shortcut to being spiritual. It's a long road, but it's a good road. I got to thinking we've seen three people saved this year. I got three people to baptize here for too long. It's been a rough year, it's been a lots of ups and downs. But when I look back and see those three people, those three ladies that's gotten saved, <laughs> it's worth every mile of the trip. Every bump, every heartache, every sorrow, everything I've had to go through, everything you've had to go through, it's worth it. 
to see lives changed and people saved. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed.